To this point of our course, we have considered the letter of First Clement and the letters of Ignatius. One of the leaders of the early church that we learn about from the letters of Ignatius is the bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp. In some ways, we're better informed about Polycarp than any other figure in early 2nd century Christianity. Not only do we have the letter written to him by Ignatius, we also have a letter by him written to the Christians in the city of Philippi. And we have a book written about him, specifically about his arrest, trial, and execution, the martyrdom of Polycarp, which we'll be considering later in this course as it's another one of the Apostolic Fathers. In this lecture, we're particularly interested in the letter that Polycarp himself wrote at the request of the Philippian Christians for some advice. The letter is one of the shorter and, one must admit, least inspiring of the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. It consists largely of generalized pieces of advice, often framed in very traditional language that consists of constant quotations of and allusions to earlier Christian writings. Let me give you a sense for the kind of generalized advice that one gets uh, in, in the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians. Uh, this is just taken from chapter 10. And so, says Polycarp, you should stand firm in these things and follow the example of the Lord, secure and unmovable in your faith, loving the brotherhood, caring for one another, united in the truth, waiting on one another in the gentleness of the Lord, looking down on no one. Okay, well, this is good good advice, but there's nothing uh, particularly compelling about it. When you are able to do good, do not put it off, since giving to charity frees a person from death. Let all of you be subject to one another, keeping your interactions with the outsiders above reproach. Okay, so behave well with one another and uh, don't be a cause of blame for, for our outsiders. Teach all, therefore, to conduct themselves in a sober way, as you yourselves are doing. This is the kind of general advice and admonition that one finds throughout the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians. Despite the general nature of much of the letter, there are several interesting aspects of Polycarp's uh, epistle to the Philippians. For one thing, it appears that Polycarp wrote this letter in part in response to the Philippians' request for a collection of the letters of Ignatius. How, do, how is it that we have a collection of Ignatius's letters? Why is it that they simply didn't scatter as soon as they were sent? So that the ones he sent to Smyrna stayed in Smyrna, the one to Trallies stayed in Trallies, the one to Rome stayed in Rome. How is it that they got collected together and got transmitted together through the centuries as a, as a collection of letters? Well, it appears that the collection was originally made by Polycarp himself. The Philippians, the church in Philippi, had evidently met up with Ignatius as he was traveling to Rome on way to his martyrdom. And they've written Polycarp asking him to provide them with the other letters that he has available to him. They are interested, the Philippians are interested in a collection of Ignatius's writings. Since Polycarp's church was where Ignatius had written four of his letters. Remember when, uh, when Ignatius wrote his letters, he wrote four letters from Smyrna. Well, Smyrna is where Polycarp was the bishop. And so presumably, uh, the letters to the Ephesians, the Magnesians, the Trallians, and the Romans, these were the letters sent from Smyrna. Evidently, uh, copies of the letter were kept in the, in the church of Smyrna. So when he sent the letter, they made a copy for themselves because they thought they'd be worth keeping. And so Polycarp had those letters. Moreover, two of the other letters uh, were sent to the Church of Smyrna. So the letter to the Smyrnians and the letter to Polycarp, which means six of, seven, six of Ignatius's seven letters would have been available to uh, Polycarp there in Smyrna, all of the letters of Ignatius, except for the letter to the uh, Philadelphians. Uh, and Philadelphia was not that far away from Smyrna, and so they may have acquired a copy of that letter as well. And so it may well be that the collection of Ignatius's letters that got transmitted down through the Middle Ages to modern times 
may, may have originally been made by, by Polycarp himself. Uh, so we're told, uh, we get the background of this in uh, Polycarp's own letter when he says in chapter 13, verse 2, we have forwarded to you the letters of Ignatius that he sent to us, in other words, the ones to Smyrna and to Polycarp, along with all the others we had with us, just as you directed us to do. These accompany this letter. You'll be able to profit greatly from them, for they deal with faith and endurance and all edification that is suitable in our Lord. And so the letters of Ignatius appear to have been collected by none other than Polycarp himself, as evidenced in this letter to the, Philipp to the Philippians. It's also interesting to note from this letter to the Philippians that, um, that Polycarp is concerned to address several problems in the Philippian church. Now, this doesn't seem to be the, the kind of situation that you had with First Clement. If you remember, in First Clement, we had a situation where uh, the Church of Rome is writing a letter to the church in Corinth to uh, deal with a problem, an internal problem in the Church of Corinth. There's nothing in First Clement to suggest that the, the Corinthians have asked for any advice. This is a case where the Roman church is intervening in the affairs of another church. That's not what's going on here with Polycarp's letter. In Polycarp's letter, uh, he's dealing with problems that have arisen in the church of Philippi, but they've asked him about these problems as a respected church leader. And so he's writing in response to a letter that they've sent him asking for, for some advice. To make sense of the problems that are occurring in the church of Philippi, it might help to sketch a bit of background to what we know about Christianity in this city. Philippi was, uh, was a city in uh, ancient Macedonia. It was uh, the main city in ancient Macedonia, which is the northern part of what we uh, today call, call Greece. We know about the early history of this church from uh, what we're told in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament, and especially from the letters of Paul in the New Testament. Because, as it turns out, Paul was the one who founded the church in Philippi. According to the book of Acts, uh, the, the historical narrative that uh, describes Paul's missionary journeys, Philippi was one of the first places that Paul visited on his missionary journeys when he went over to Macedonia and Achaia. He converted a wealthy woman named Lydia... To, uh, to the faith, and he converted uh, several other people to the faith. There's one very interesting story in the book of Acts. It's in chapter 16 of Acts, where Paul is actually uh, thrown in jail because he has um, uh, he's ruined the business of some men who were using a young woman who was possessed by a demon for purposes of divination. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, but the, the, this woman had a demon inside of her who could predict the future. And so they set up this kind of uh, fortune-telling business where she would predict the future uh, for a price uh, because of this demon inside of her. And uh, then they, they, would, they would make some money off this. So this was a kind of a business they had set up. And Paul, uh, being a good Christian apostle, cast out the demon from this woman so that these people then incurred this huge financial loss because their business was destroyed. And so they get angry and decide that Paul is a troublemaker and they, they arrange for him to be arrested. He's arrested and he's thrown in jail. And uh, while he's in jail, he and his partner, Silas, are in, in bonds in jail. They're, they're handcuffed in jail, and they're singing hymns to, to God, you know, rejoicing for their suffering. And uh, an earthquake comes and knocks down the walls of the, uh, of the prison, and their shackles fall off. And uh, so they're going, to be, they're going to be free to just kind of walk out. The jailer realizes that this has happened and pulls out his own sword to commit suicide because he, he's going to be punished for, uh, for the escape of these prisoners. And Paul calls out to him, uh, don't, don't kill yourself, don't do any harm to yourself. And the man says, well, what can I do to be saved? Which probably means, you know, how can I get off the hook here? But Paul takes this in a theological sense and says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. <laughs> and so the man says, okay, and he converts right on the spot to Christianity with no, no instruction at all about who Jesus Christ was. But he becomes a believer on the spot and his whole family becomes believers on the spot. And uh, 
Paul and Silas spend the evening, the rest of the night then with his, this jailer and his family, and these are then among the first converts. Uh, and then Paul leaves almost right away, according to the book of Acts. So that's the beginning of the church of Philippi, according to the book of Acts. Paul himself doesn't mention either Lydia, the, the wealthy woman who converted, or the Philippian jailer when he talks about the uh, the beginning of the church in Philippi. Uh, his We do have a letter from Paul, though, addressed to the Philippian church in the New Testament. This would be a letter that was written about 60 years before Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. And so we have background to uh, the Philippian church from Paul himself. And we learn in this letter from Paul that Paul did indeed found uh, this church in Philippi, and that when he left the church in Philippi, he learned about difficulties that the Philippians were having in his absence. And Paul, as was his custom, wrote a letter in order to help these Philippian uh, Christians deal with the particular problems that had arisen in their midst after he had gone. It's interesting to note the nature of these two problems that uh, Paul addresses in his letter to the Philippians, because in in general terms, they're the same two problems that show up in Polycarp's letter 60 years later. Two problems. One is a problem of false teachers. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he indicates that there are false teachers who are troubling the church of Philippi. In other words, there are heretics who have shown up. And so Paul, in some rather strong language, says in Philippians chapter 3, "...beware of the dogs." Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Okay, who's he warning against? Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. That sounds a lot like the people he opposes in Galatia when he says, beware of those who want to circumcise you. For uh, for it is we who are the circumcision. Okay, so that is the issue. Who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. People who believe in Christ Jesus are the circumcision, meaning that bodily circumcision doesn't really matter. The, the, the rite of circumcision was, was uh, a Jewish practice to indicate that the Jews were among the chosen people. The, the Jews were the ones chosen by God. Circumcision was given by God in the Old Testament as, as a sign that those who are circumcised are the people of God. Paul is saying... That's, that's no longer the case. Those who believe in Christ are the true circumcision. And so there's no reason to mutilate the flesh. There's no reason uh, to actually perform the rite of circumcision. Paul goes on to say that uh, if, one pra- if one engages in the practice of circumcision, one is boasting in the flesh. You're assuming that this fleshly operation puts you right with God. Paul goes on to say that it's not, he's not saying this because he's anti-Jewish. He says, if anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew who was born to Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, I was found blameless. Paul indicates that he was a good Jew. And uh, so it's, it's not a question about whether he's being anti-Jewish or not, he, but he thinks that true Judaism is Judaism that believes in Christ as the Messiah. So, the problem that Paul addresses in Philippians is the problem of a Judaizing form of Christianity. A second problem that he addresses is a problem of disunity in the church. There's been some infighting among church members, a common problem in the ancient world, and, as I understand, a common problem today in many churches. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord, says Paul in chapter 4, verse 2. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, to help these women, for they've struggled beside me in the work of the gospel. So uh, these two need to be of the same mind, meaning that they're, uh, they're at odds with one another, and they need to reconcile their differences. Much of Paul's letter to the Philippians is about unity in the church in which he insists that if people are more concerned about the uh, difficulties of others rather than themselves, there will be unity because everybody will be concerned for everybody else. That's why Paul says that the Philippians ought to emulate the example of Christ, who even though he was in the form of God, 
He gave up equality with God to be a human. So Christ gave up his own prerogatives as a divine being to be a human for the sake of others. People ought to emulate that example by giving up themselves for the sake of others, and when they do so, then all problems of internal turmoil in the church will be resolved. So those are the two problems that Paul addresses in his letter to the Philippians some 60 years before uh, Polycarp wrote his letter to the Philippians. In Polycarp's day, the Philippian church had other difficulties from the, the specific ones that Paul addresses, but they were broadly related to those confronted by Paul, as once again the problems in the Philippian church involve false teaching and internal turmoil. Now, by the time we get to Polycarp, the false teaching is no longer a form of Judaizing Christianity as it was in Paul's day. In Paul's day, the problem was uh, people uh, who were Judaizers insisting that to be true followers of Jesus, you had to be circumcised and had to keep the Jewish law. That's no longer the problem in Polycarp's day. Instead, the problem is a docetic form of Christianity a docetic form of Christianity which denied that Jesus was a real flesh and blood human being. Remember, Ignatius had to deal with both problems, both the problem of Judaizing Christians and the problem of docetic Christians. The letter to Polycarp deals just with the one. There appear to be, in the midst of the Philippian church, Christians who, uh, who embrace a docetic kind of Christology one which said that Jesus wasn't really human, but only seemed to be a human. Let me read you a passage from Philippians, uh, Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 6 and 7. Polycarp says, We should be zealous for what is good, avoiding stumbling blocks and false brothers. Okay, you call a heretic a false brother. In a sense, they're a brother because they're a Christian, but they're false brothers because they're heretics. And those who carry the name of the Lord in hypocrisy leading the empty-minded astray. <laughs> so enemies are always hypocrites, and uh, they have effect only on the empty-minded. Any, any right-thinking person, of course, won't ever be led astray by heresy. Then he goes on to explain what the heresy is. For anyone who does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is an antichrist. And whoever does not confess the witness of the cross is from the devil. Uh, and whoever distorts the words of the Lord for his own passions, saying that there is neither resurrection nor judgment, this one is the firstborn of Satan. Okay, so who is he opposing? He's opposing those who do not say that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Well, that sounds very much like what you get in 1 John chapter 4, which, uh, which I talked about uh, in a previous lecture. 1 John chapter 4, where the author is opposing a docetic Christology by saying that everyone who confesses that Jesus came in the flesh is from God, but everybody who denies that Jesus came in the flesh is not from God, but is the Antichrist. This is so similar to 1 John that some scholars think that Polycarp is actually quoting 1 John at, at this point. That, that, that's possible. He goes on to say, whoever does not confess the witness of the cross is from the devil. How is it that a docetist would not confess the witness of the cross? Well, if Jesus wasn't really a flesh and blood body, he couldn't really shed blood because he didn't really have blood. And so, according to the arguments against docetists, uh, docetists denied the effect of the cross. And so he's saying, if you do that, then uh, you're from the devil. And whoever says there's not a resurrection or judgment is the firstborn of Satan. Uh, who would deny a resurrection? Well, people who don't believe that Christ had a real body don't think the humans will be raised bodily from the dead either. They deny that there'll be a future resurrection and a future judgment. So these appear to be docetists. Some scholars have uh, suspected that Polycarp is, in fact, opposing a specific docetist that we know about, the one that I mentioned in a previous lecture, the second century uh, thinker and philosopher, and uh, Christian theologian, Marcion. If you remember, Marcion was a, uh, a, a Christian thinker from the middle of the second century who took Paul's understanding that there's a difference between the law that God has given to the Jews and the gospel of Christ. He took this to an extreme. 
to say that the law of the Jews, in fact, stands over against the gospel of Christ, that there's an absolute distinction between the law and the gospel, so much so there are actually two different gods. The God of the Old Testament, who's a God of wrath and judgment, who created this world and called Israel to be his people and gave them his law, that God, the God of the Old Testament, who stands over against the God of Jesus, who came to save people from the harsh, wrathful God of the Old Testament. According to Marcion, God, uh, the God who created this world is not the God of Jesus. And Marcion went to great lengths in order to, uh, to show that there must be two different gods. Jesus, therefore, could not belong to this other God, the one who created this world, and that's why Jesus was not born in a normal, natural way. By the uh, sexual union of his parents, Jesus descended as a full-grown adult from heaven in the appearance of human flesh. One reason scholars have suspected that Polycarp may be opposing Marcion himself is because he says that the Antichrist is the firstborn of Satan. Now, why would that make it make make somebody suspect he's talking about Marcion? Because of another story we know about Polycarp from this other book that we will be discussing later, Polycarp's Martyrdom, the Martyrdom of Polycarp. There's an epilogue to the Martyrdom of Polycarp that gives a little anecdote of something that happened during uh, during Polycarp's lifetime, a very interesting anecdote that is recounted uh, allegedly, according to this epilogue, the, the, this anecdote was related by Irenaeus, who was a late second century church father. Irenaeus is a late second century church father who wrote a five volume book against heresies. We still have this five volume book against heresies, a very interesting reading. Irenaeus allegedly was a disciple of Polycarp. And he told the story uh, about Polycarp that I'm going to give you now. Irenaeus said that Polycarp powerfully refuted every heresy and passed on the ecclesiastical and universal rule of faith as he received it from the Holy One. So he passed on the tradition that Polycarp had given him. He also says that Marcion, from whom come those who are called Marcionites, once met with the Holy Polycarp and said to him, so Marcion talking to Polycarp said, you need to recognize us, Polycarp. In other words, you need to uh, admit us into, our, into your fellowship. You need to recognize us as, as valid Christians. Polycarp then replied to Marcion, I do recognize you. I recognize the firstborn of Satan. So I do know who you are. You're the firstborn of Satan. So I do recognize you. And so this, this witty reply. Now, the key phrase there, though, is the firstborn of Satan. Because in Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, he says that the one who denies that Christ came in the flesh is the Antichrist, is the firstborn of Satan. And so is it possible that Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, in fact, is directed against Marcion? You understand the logic of that? It makes sense, but uh, in fact, there's a, there's a big problem with it. Uh, the, the big problem with thinking that Polycarp's letter is actually being addressed against the uh, against Marcion himself uh, is the uh, the big problem is the dates involved. Marcion uh, was prominent in uh, Christianity. He he started uh, propounding his understanding of the faith seriously uh, in the mid 140s. And there's reason for thinking that Polycarp's letter to the um, uh, to the Philippians was actually written about 30 years earlier, uh, because it sounds like Ignatius has just kind of passed through town, and the Philippians want a, want a collection of his letters, and so Polycarp's writing to give them the collection of the letters. So it sounds like this letter is being written 20 or 30 years before Marcion showed up on the scene, and so. Uh, probably what's going on is that Polycarp had this kind of expression that he liked, this epithet, firstborn of Satan, that he applied to people who were do docetic. And he applied it in his letter to the Philippians, to anyone who's an antichrist, anyone who's a docetic. And then later in his life, when he had an encounter with Marcion, it was an appropriate epithet for the occasion, and so he applied it in that case. Which, which pr probably means that his letter to the Philippians is directed to docetic teaching more generally, but not against Marcion. In particular, the first problem then that Polycarp addresses in his letter to the Philippians is the problem of false teaching. The second problem, again, is similar to a problem that Paul addressed in his New Testament letter of Philippians, is the problem of internal turmoil. 
a problem of internal turmoil. In this case, it's not that there are two women who are fighting it out in the congregation as it was in uh, the case of Paul's letter with Euodia and Syntyche, these two leading women of the uh, Philippian church in the uh, early first, in the middle first century. In this case, it has to do with somebody who was a, an elder in the church of Philippi, a guy named Valens, who apparently had uh, absconded with some of the church funds. Uh, it looks like there was a case of embezzlement. Polycarp says uh, in chapter 11, I am extremely sad for Valens, once a presbyter among you, that he should so misunderstand the office that was given him. Thus I urge you to abstain from love of money and to be pure and truthful. Abstain from every kind of evil. For if one cannot control himself in such things, how can he preach self-control to another? Now he doesn't come out and say that this is a problem of embezzlement. He says that there's some problem with his uh, former presbyter, Valens, and since he's a former presbyter, that suggests that probably he's been removed from his from his office. And he he alludes to the he doesn't have to tell the Philippians what the problem is with Valens because Valens was the presbyter of their church, and the problem is in they know what the problem is. So he doesn't spell it out because he doesn't know he's writing for us. He thinks he's writing to the to the Philippians, but he implies that the problem has to do with an excessive love of money. Because you're to, uh, he goes on to say, you're to abstain from the love of money and that you need to exercise some self-control. Well, it sounds like this guy couldn't control himself with respect to money. So it's not absolutely clear that this is a case of embezzlement, but it has something to do with a, a misuse of money because of, of a desire for riches. It's important to recall that wealth had always been a big issue from the Christian, for the Christians from the time of Jesus himself. Wealth had always been a big issue for Christians. Even in Jesus' ministry, it appears that the problem of wealth was well known. Uh, we have stories about Jesus dealing with the problems of rich people. The most famous story is the case of the rich young ruler. Uh, he's called, a, this is a, that's the name for the story, the rich young ruler. It occurs in Mark chapter 10 and in the parallel passages in Matthew and Luke. Uh, the term rich young ruler actually isn't appropriate, even though that's what the story is always called, because in only one gospel is he a ruler, and in only one other gospel is he young. In all of them, he's rich, but in none of them is he a rich young ruler. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, uh, so what happens is this fellow comes up, to, this rich man comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, uh, keep the commandments. And the man says, well, which ones? <laughs> And he says, well, uh, you, know, you know what they say, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't, uh, uh, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And the man says, well, I've, I've done all those things, so what am I lacking? Jesus says, well, you lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then follow me and you'll have riches in heaven. The guy walks away downtrodden because he's very rich. He doesn't want to sell everything he has, and so he, he doesn't do what he needs to have eternal life. Jesus' uh, disciples then are wondering, well, why, why does a rich person have to give away everything? And Jesus tells them, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's, that's rough. And the disciples have trouble understanding it. And they say, then how can anybody be saved? And Jesus says, well, with humans, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Well, if it's that difficult, uh, maybe people should give up their riches. And in fact, throughout the New Testament, uh, in the book of James, in the book of 1 Timothy, and in other places, there is an emphasis that rich people ought to give up their wealth for the sake of others. Later in Christianity, as rich people started coming more frequently into the church, the church leaders somewhat modified that teaching, <laughs> uh, in part because they, I mean, having wealthy people in the congregation is a useful thing. And so later the teaching came to be that, uh, uh, that people shouldn't be attached to their wealth if they have it. It's okay to have it, just don't be attached to it. Uh, and so the teaching went, and people emphasized that with God, of course, all things are possible. Uh, so even rich people can enter the kingdom. So uh, Polycarp deals with two major issues, the issue of, uh, of false teaching and the issue of wealth in the churches. Let me uh, sum up then what we find from Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. He wrote to the Philippians for four reasons. 
to give them some general advice and moral exhortation, to provide them a collection of, Paul, of Ignatius's letters, to deal with the problem of false teaching in their midst, and to discuss the problem that was probably a problem of embezzlement that had occurred in their midst. In fulfilling these various tasks, Polycarp constantly quotes earlier Christian texts as authorities for his views, as we'll see in the next lecture. The next lecture will see why his quotation of earlier texts is significant for understanding how one uh, set of Christian texts actually became a canon of sacred scripture.